Good evening, and welcome back to our service this evening. Hopefully that was a little bit more of a lively song for you. Uh, what we're going to do tonight throughout the service is give an opportunity for a couple... Of, don't go away, you're leading the music. Uh, <laughs> We're going to give you opportunity for a couple of pop-up testimonies tonight, all right? We just sang about Daniel and David, and, and uh, we have the same God today that they served. Uh, so, so as we start the summer months, June, July, and August, uh, let's start tonight with an opportunity for you to share maybe a word of testimony, something that was an encouragement to you or might be an encouragement to someone else. So I mention that now so you can be thinking a little bit as we begin our song service. All right, Caleb, come and lead us in our opening song. Amen. Well, tell me if y'all are out, if I'm not loud enough. Uh, I've been told that those in the back can't hear me. And so uh, we're going to take our hymn books. We're going to turn over to hymn number 476. Hymn number 476, it is glory to walk with him. And we're going to stand as we sing. Hymn number 476. service and prayer. We had a call from Carol Adams after the service this morning. A friend of the family, a young man, I believe he's 21 years of age, named Kyle Pfeiffer. He was involved in a four-wheeler accident and was life flighted to Pittsburgh to the hospital there. So I don't know uh, if it was someone local or out of town, but his name was Kyle Pfeiffer and she called asking us to pray for him. So let's go to Lord in prayer tonight. Father, we come before you just thanking you and praising you. What a glory it is to be able to walk with you each and every day. Father, that you so loved us that you sent Jesus Christ to die on Calvary's cross for our sins, that through Christ we can have that personal relationship with you, we can walk with thee, and that, Father, we have fellowship with you each and every day. Uh, we pray, Father, that we would be encouraged tonight in the things of the Lord as we come to the word of God. Use it to encourage our own hearts and Father, may we just be faithful to serve you and to continue to study the scriptures that we might grow thereby. We do pray for this young man, Kyle Pfeiffer. You know his physical needs, Father, as a result of the accident. We pray you'd be with him. We pray, Father, for his spiritual needs as well. If he's not saved, that Father, through this, you might somehow bring a gospel witness to him and speak to his own heart about his spiritual needs. And then, Father, I believe I saw in the news today that there was another shooting uh, in Philadelphia last evening and a number of people were killed so we continue to pray for families affected by this violence, Father, that you would use these things to turn hearts to God. Even as we mentioned the other week, the, the root issue is that we have forgotten God. We've gotten away from the house of the Lord. We've gotten away from the things of God. We are filling our time with earthly pleasures and earthly things. And as a result, Father, we are reaping the consequences of a generation that does not know God. So help us, Father, to be faithful to you, to be faithful to the word. And just encourage us today, in Christ's name we pray, amen.
Amen. We're going to take our hymn books one more, uh, another time again. Uh, to hymn number 326, more about Jesus. More about Jesus what I know, more of his grace to others show. More of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me. Isn't that wonderful? Let's sing about the love of Jesus this evening. Hymn number 326. just kidding when I hollered at Mrs. Doherty there. We don't, I, don't, we, I was just kidding too. <laughs> we, we all make our mistakes. So if you didn't hear the story of the teenagers this morning, Mr. Whitfield called in sick. So I taught the teen class. So I get back there to find out they have been critiquing my bulletin and they found all the mistakes that I had in it this week. And so they started pointing them out to me. And, and at the first thing it says at the top under the, it says Sunday, Sunday, June 5th. And they said the word Sunday is there twice. I was like, now how in the world did that happen? I never changed that. I just changed the date. So I went back this afternoon to see how long it's been that way. I have bulletins that go back a year. <laughs> and it's been that way at least a year. <laughs> so if you see a mistake, I don't need you to go critiquing the bulletin and looking for all my mistakes. But if you see one, let me know because... I don't apparently read the bulletin. <laughs> we'll be glad to correct it. But apparently no one else reads the bulletin either. <laughs> uh, but, uh, and then uh, Mr. Bowmaster, I had his name. I missed the S. I guess they said it was Mr. Bowmatter. Uh, so, and they said, it's wrong every time. And I said, the wonders of copy and paste. If you get it wrong the first time, it's wrong all the other times. Uh, then afterwards, Maddie goes, what time's choir rehearsal? I said, 5 o'clock. She says, it says 5.30 in the bulletin. I was like, oh, well, that's a mistake too. So <laughs> I sent out a text. Secretary. I need a secretary. Yes, I need a secretary. Oh. 
<laughs> anyway, mistakes, they happen. We're, God is good. God is gracious. Yeah, you have to laugh at yourself sometimes with the things that you do, but God is good. Well, let's go to Lord in prayer for the offering tonight. Nelson, would you ask God's blessing on the offering, please? Amen. These words are from Psalm 103.
Amen. Thank you. Bless the Lord means to speak well of. I like that for he has done great things. Uh, you catch that tune, God is so good. There's a, a little tune that pops in there where those words were. So who would like to start us off tonight and speak well of the Lord? Mrs. Kyle. She was ready. I'm ready. And I didn't tell her we were doing this either. <laughs> All right. Who's next? Mrs. Doherty. I'm really thankful that you can look this direction and see what I'm <laughs> um, One of the things I'm so thankful for is that God gave me this ministry. So if you're ever contemplating a ministry and you're afraid you'll make a mistake, just think of Pastor Kyle and I. <laughs> Amen. All right. Who else? Amen. Appreciate that. Anybody else? All right. Mrs. Uh, yeah. Meg Van Dyne. Miss Van Dyne. Amen. Amen. Yes, her aunt passed away, and I had that in the bulletin trust. You'll set a card of encouragement to Meg. Amen. All right, somebody else. <clears throat> Anybody else? Now's your opportunity. All right, I don't see anybody else. All right, Caleb, we're going to come sing one more time, and then we'll go to the Word of God. Amen. Well, it's a wonderful blessing. We're going to sing hymn number 391, A Flag to Follow. Hymn number 391, as we stand as we sing this evening. Hymn number 391.
Amen. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. I'm thankful for the visitors that God has been bringing our way. We had a, a young lady this morning and her, her daughter with us visiting. And uh, I was reading this recently in Warren Wearsby, uh, his book on being a leader for the Lord or being a leader or servant of God. And one of the things he mentioned in there, he says, you don't build a church through promotion, you build it through prayer. You know, now we do promote and uh, we do what we can to put our name out there to advertise, let people know we're here, but God works and answers to prayer. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But he does that in answer to our prayers. And so I trust that you'll continue to pray. And when we have visitors, that you'll take time when you can to greet them and introduce yourself, uh, get to know them a little bit along the way. Ephesians chapter 3. Now, next Sunday is our VBS prep Sunday, so we do not have an evening service. We'll have a luncheon, and then no evening service as we get ready for a Bible school and get things set up for that in the afternoon, and then we'll take a break in the evening as we have Bible school all next week. And then the week after that, we will have our service, but it'll be VBS closing, so it'll be a different type of service, but we'll still have our service. Trust you'll be here, see what the boys and girls have been doing throughout the week, and we'll sort of wrap up our vacation Bible school. And then when we get to the end of June, we'll be back in Ephesians chapter 3. So after tonight, we get a little two-week break uh, from the book of Ephesians, and then we'll come back and wrap up chapter number 3 on the last Sunday in June. And then we have the Ambassador Men's Ensemble from Ambassador Baptist College in Shelby, North Carolina. They'll be here on the Tuesday uh, after that, would be June the 28th, I believe. And that's our Senior Saint Potluck Dinner. So trust you'll sign up. Uh, it's been a while since we've had our Senior Saints ministry going. And so this is sort of the kickoff for that. Mr. and Mrs. Littleton are assisting with that ministry. So we'll look forward to a good evening on Tuesday the 28th with the Ambassador Group and our Senior Saints. And then, of course, they'll be having the service at 7 o'clock on that Tuesday. So there'll be no Wednesday evening service that night. It'll be Tuesday instead of Wednesday. Well, in our last message in Ephesians chapter 3, two weeks ago, we looked at Paul's introduction to his prayer here in chapter 3. Back in chapter 1, Paul had prayed for the enlightenment for the believers at Ephesus, and now he's going to be praying for their enablement. As believers, our first need in terms of Scripture is for enlightenment. The Bible teaches that it is a book that is spiritual in nature and thus foreign to the natural heart and to the natural mind of man. It can only be discerned through the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. That's why sometimes we read a passage, even as believers, you can read a passage and you get done and you look at it and say, what exactly is, that, is he talking about? You know, it's hard to understand sometimes. And even Jesus, when he was teaching them, they said, these things are hard to understand what you're teaching us. Because they're spiritual in nature, and so the natural mind doesn't easily discern them. So the first thing we have to do is pray that God will show us and reveal to us the truth of his words, that he'll provide enlightenment, help us to see what we cannot see, what's hidden from us. And that, that throughout life ought to be our prayer. No doubt there have been times where you've read over a passage numerous times, and then you come to it, and you're reading over it, and suddenly you see something you never saw before. How is that possible? Well, God enables us. He enlightens us, enables us to see something we couldn't see before. So that's the first step we need, enlightenment. But once we understand what God is saying, the next thing we need is enablement to do it, to obey what God is telling us. There are those Christians who lack understanding in the Word of God. The Bible refers to them as babes in Christ. Well, when you have a baby, what do you have to do? It takes a lot of patience, doesn't it? Doesn't it, Maddie? A lot of patience, right? You have to feed them when they want fed, right? You have to change them when they need change, whether it's convenient for you or not. You've got them all cleaned up, ready to go out the door, and boom, what do they do? They spit up all over themselves, and you've got to go back and start over, and now you're going to be late, and it takes a lot of patience. And when we see new people come to Christ, we immediately expect them to be, boom, super Christians, doesn't happen that way, all right? They're babes in Christ. They lack understanding. And so through much patience and teaching of the word of God, they're fed the milk of the word that they can begin to grow. But at the same time, there are many Christians who have been taught the word of God over such an extended period of time, maybe most of their lifetime, that they know what the Bible says and yet they struggle to do it. It's not a problem with understanding. 
They know they're to read the Bible. They know they're to go to church. They know they're to live a, a Christian life and to walk with the Lord. And they, they know a lot of the details all about it. And if you ask them, they could probably tell you the details. But yet they struggle in their Christian life to do those things. I, I, I tend to think of it as being stranded on an island between knowing and doing. And they're there. They're stuck there. And sometimes we find ourselves stuck in that position. And so we have to pray that God will enable us to do what he has instructed us to do. Paul said, pray for me that boldness may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the gospel. All right? Even the apostle Paul said, pray for me that God will give me the courage and the boldness to preach his word in the face of opposition. I mean, if the apostle Paul needed to be prayer for boldness, don't we? Wouldn't we need the same prayer? Joshua, the great general, God said, be strong and of a good courage. And we need that same admonition to be strong in the Lord in the power of his might. We need to be courageous for the things of the Lord. And so let's begin reading here in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 and 19. Paul says, I pray that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul's desire for the church at Ephesus is not only for their salvation, but for their spiritual growth, that they might mature in the faith, that they would continue on in the things of God, and so he begins in verse 16 by recognizing that this enablement comes from God. I pray that he, that is God, would grant you. God is the one that is, in, is able to enable us. And so Paul is praying to God the Father from whom all blessings flow. If God did not enable them, they would never be able to carry out or to continue on in the work of the Lord. Paul further understood that God works in answer to prayer. In James chapter 4, verse 2, it says, Ye have not because ye ask not. Spiritual weakness can always be traced back to an anemic prayer life. We are weak spiritually because we do not pray enough. The word grant, he says here, that he would grant you, that word means to give. To give. Paul said, I'm praying that God will give you the spirit of power. That God will strengthen you. James 1, 17, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. If we desire to obey and do the will of God, then we have to ask for God to help us to do it for his enablement. Paul also draws our attention to the truth that this enablement is according to the riches of his glory. The riches of his glory could also be worded according to his glorious riches. That is, out of the great abundance of his grace and mercy and power, which abide in his glory, he is able to meet every need to enable us to accomplish his will and his purpose for our lives. Mrs. Dockerty, in her testimony, and this isn't in my message, but I'm going to throw it in here. She mentioned how it wasn't her plan to be an organist. How old did you say? Nine years old? She had no idea what God had planned, but God had a plan for it, and we have benefited from it for all these years. And we don't have anybody in the wings at the moment that I know of that's going to step up and help when, when she's not able to. So we're just praying that God helps her to live forever. Amen. <laughs> I had a college, uh, when we were in Mansfield, Mrs. Borky played the organ at the church. She was a retired tired professor. She shook so bad. She, I don't know if it was Parkinson's or what, but she, she couldn't hardly eat without you know, with spilling her food, getting it to her mouth. But when she sat at the organ, she could play anything. Never, I mean, she just, when she played, I don't know how she did it. It's like someone who stutters, and then when they sing, they don't. And, and so she had played the organ all of her life, and, and she was able to, to do that even after she had developed the, the shaking in her body. And so we don't know what God has planned for us, but God has a plan. And God is enab will enable you to do what his plan is. 
you know my testimony. I never wanted to preach any more than she probably wanted to play organ. But here we are. And God has to enable us to do it. It's not in our own power or in our own strength. It's by the grace and the mercy and the power of God. So as we come to this prayer tonight, there are five things that Paul is going to ask of God on behalf of the believers. And I want you to think of these five things as building blocks. All right, when we have children, we like to build up the blocks. You take and you put one and one, you stack them up. And what do they do? Yeah, they come over and just knock them right back down, right? All right. Well, we're building. Satan is knocking down. He wants to knock them down. And so we have to make sure that we're building them consecutively upon another. And, and Satan always tries to take out the bottom one first because if he gets the bottom one, the rest of them will fall. And so let's take a look at this prayer tonight. Father, as we come to the Word of God, use this passage of the Scripture to encourage our own hearts in the faith, in the work of the Lord. We need the help of God tonight. We need the enablement of God to be able to serve you and do what you have called us to do. The flesh is weak, but the Spirit is willing. And so help us, dear Lord. And we'll thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. The first thing we see here is Paul prays for strength. He says that he would grant you, according to his riches and glory, his introduction, number one, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. I pray this prayer frequently. This, this, this is a powerful prayer. I use it in my own prayer life, and I trust that you will as well. But we need to pray for strength. Now, oftentimes, we think of strength in terms of physical strength. I need a strength to get up in the morning. I'm feeling tired. I need a physical strength, and there's nothing wrong with that. But he's talking about the spiritual strength, to face the spiritual battles, to speak for the Lord, to be faithful to the things of God. All right, so he's talking about this inner strength. As believers, we are in a continual warfare between the flesh and the spirit. Galatians 5.17 says, For the flesh lusteth or warreth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. When you want to do right and you want to obey God, the flesh is going to fight against you to keep you from doing what you should do when it comes to the things of God. God may want you to witness for Him. The flesh is going to give you every reason it can why you can't do it. Oh, you don't know them. You better not go. Oh, you, you don't know what to say. You better not say anything. And so the flesh fights against us whenever we are, God prompts us to the Spirit, you need to do this. And the flesh says, oh, you don't want to do that. You may want to be faithful to church. The flesh is going to try and convince you that it's not possible. At every turn, the flesh is going to fight against anything spiritual in your life. In Romans 7, and 23, Paul says, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. As a believer, there should be an inward desire to obey, serve, and please God. But our sin nature is constantly warring against all that is godly. Therefore, we are admonished to do three things. One, crucify the flesh. We're to crucify the flesh with the affections and lusts, Galatians 5, 28. Put it to death. Now, we need our flesh, our body. He's not talking about taking your life here. Crucifying the flesh speaks about putting to death the desires of the flesh, denying yourself those things. You know, if you're on a diet, now personally, I've not experienced this, but if you have to diet, from what I understand, you know, you go to that refrigerator, it's t the, say your flesh wants something. You get a craving for something and you've got to deny it and say, no, I cannot have that last brownie or that last cookie. No, I'm not going to go and open up that refrigerator door because I, if I do, I know I'm going to. And it's a constant battle. The flesh wants you to do what you're trying not to do. And the same is true in the spiritual life. When we know God wants us to do something, that our flesh battles against it. And so we have to, we have to put to death those desires, those affections. We have to say no to them. We're not going to do it. It can be immoral desires. Uh, it can be a temptation to, of sin in terms of maybe stealing or lying or maybe an unkind word that is spoken. You know, why we, somebody does something and immediately, oh, man, and you're going to put that to death. Put it to death. Don't give in to it. 
The second thing we have to do is we have to put off the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust in Ephesians 4.22. Paul says, put to death the affections, the desires, put off the old man, all of those things. Put it away from you, far away from you. Get rid of it in your life. Don't give it an opportunity to flourish. And that brings us to the third thing in Romans 13, 14. Make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Don't put yourself in that position where you are going to be tempted in an area that you know you struggle with. And so as we go through life, this flesh nature that we battle against, God gives us some instructions in our word how to get victory over that flesh. Don't make provision for the flesh. Put it off. Don't feed it. Do away. Die to the flesh and the things thereof. If we're to be victorious in a Christian life, not only must the flesh be made weak, but also the spirit must be made strong. You see, I, I, can, I can do everything I can to put to death the flesh in my life, to, to deny, its, deny its lusts and its desires. I can do everything I can not to make provision for the flesh. I can do everything I can to, to weaken the flesh in my life, but if I do not strengthen the spirit, it'll be to no avail. You have to feed the spirit of God. You have to grow spiritually. We understand physically all right, if you have a child, you, uh, you say, no snacks before supper. All right, you, you're not giving them any snacks because you don't want them to ruin their appetite. You know that those snacks are not going to benefit them in the long run, that they need substantial food to be able to grow. Now, if every kid had their way, they would probably eat everything that's not good for them as often as they could. And you got to work to get them to eat what they should. When I was, as youth pastor, when many years when I took the young people away to camp, I had a rule, no candy. Don't bring it with you. Why not? Why can't we? I said, you don't need it. We'll provide everything you need to eat. We'll have fruit. There's apples and grapes and things that are always available. But my point in doing that was I knew if they take candy, they will eat candy. And when it comes time for dinner, they won't be hungry because the candy will have satisfied their hunger but they'll have no energy when it comes to games and they'll be weak and tired. And then they're moaning and complaining, oh, I'm so tired. Well, of course you are. You haven't eaten anything of sub substance. You have to take in the right nourishment. Spiritually, it's the same thing. You have to take in the word of God. You have got to feed on the meat of God's word and then you have to exercise and use that in your own life to help you to get stronger. So if you have a area of weakness, my wife recently had a difficulty with her ankle and so she had to do physical therapy to try and strengthen that ankle, to make it stronger, all right? Now, it doesn't do it. it. Obviously, there's times where she had to stay off of it. But staying off of it isn't going to get it stronger. You know, you may remember years ago when somebody went in for a surgery. I mean, you laid up for weeks. I remember a boy when I was in sixth grade, one of my friends broke his arm. You know, when that arm was healed and the cast was taken off, he walked around like this for months. <laughs> He was just, it was stuck there. He was so used to that. Now, nowadays, boy, you have surgery and they get you up walking right away. They don't want you to stiffen up. They are moving you and doing sometimes maybe before you're ready for it. They're doing therapy and they're doing things. Why? Because they understand you've got to work it to make it stronger. And the same is true spiritually. We have got to work at it if we're going to be stronger. The word strength, the idea of strengthening inner man speaks of fortitude. Webster in his 1828 dictionary defines fortitude as that strength or firmness of mind or soul which enables a person to encounter danger with coolness and courage or to bear pain or adversity without murmuring, depression, or despondency. The fortitude, to bear up under difficulty. Thus it is the Holy Spirit that strengthens us to face and endure difficulties. Now, how is this accomplished? How, how does the Spirit strengthen the inner man? He does so through the Word of God. It's not a mystical thing. It's not like we get down, Lord, Lord, give me strength, and boom, I get up and feel like Samson. Not, that's not what we're talking about. All right? Physical strength. You know, if you've had to go through rehab, physical strength comes little by little by little, and there's pain involved in the process. Okay? Same is true spiritually, all right? If we're going to be strengthened, the Spirit does it through the Word of God. And there is pain involved in that process. 
Sometimes the word of God speaks to us and convicts us of our sin, and we don't like that. That hurts. Don't preach on that. I don't want to hear that. Spirit says, I can't make you stronger without you going through that. And so there's times the Spirit of God convicts us of our sin. He takes us through times of difficulty and pain as we hear the Word of God. He says, hey, you need to fix this in your life. I want to use you and you need to grow. There's going to be trials and difficulties along the way. But you purpose and determine, I'm going to keep doing it. The first time you get up to do something, maybe to get up and speak. Caleb spoke for us last Sunday morning at our luncheon. You know, when you get up that first time to speak, it can be a frightening thing. Maybe the first time you get up to sing a solo or to teach a Sunday school class. The man, it's a fearful thing. Yes, but God is able. And as you do it, it might be painful for you. Man, you might be shaking in your boots and scared to death. I used to, when I, I used to get up front, my legs would shake so bad. I could, I, my pant legs were, were waving in the wind. And I, could feel, I just felt like everybody could notice that I was shaking. Now, they couldn't. But I thought they could because I could feel it. I mean, I, I was just saying, and it's hard to play the trumpet when you're shaking really bad. It really is. But it gives you a natural vibrato. It does. But you don't realize that. But you're, you know, you're, you're struggling with it. But God, as you work through that, you don't quit. You keep going. God can do great things. You know, we're talking about mistakes. I, I'll never forget. I remember my, you remember your mistakes, don't you? My brother was playing piano and I was playing trumpet. The song I was playing was a Christian cowboy. I'll be a cowboy, a Christian cowboy. Bum, 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 bum. And I made a mistake. And when I did, my brother at the piano laughed. When he laughed, I started to laugh. We never finished the song. I just sat down. We were laughing so hard. Everybody out there is probably like, what in the world are they laughing at? I don't know why we laughed. It just, it just struck us as funny. It's one of those things where somebody starts laughing and somebody else gets to laughing and before you know it, you're all laughing and nobody knows why. It's just, it just is catchy. And, and, and I could have said, that's it. I'm never going to do that again. But you get back up and you just keep going. Have there other, been other catastrophes along the way? I'm sure there have been. That one's the one that sticks in my mind. I, 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 for some reason, I, I remember that one more than others. But there have been other occasions where it hasn't gone as planned. But God is good. God gives us strength to go on. The word might comes from the same word where we get our English word dynamite. It speaks of a miraculous power. The Spirit of God takes the word of God and uses it to strengthen us with power in the inner man in a way that we may never fully understand or be able to explain to human satisfaction. But we know it to be true and we accept it by faith. And in many instances, we've experienced it in our own lives. Most of us here could probably give testimony of a time when God strengthened us to do something we didn't think we could do. So the number one, strength. Secondly, he prays for depth. As one is strengthened with might by the Spirit in the inner man through the study of God's Word and through the many trials and difficulties of life, they grow deeper in their relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And so Paul is going to use three words to illustrate or help picture the depth of our relationship with Christ. The first word he uses is the word dwell in verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Dwell. The word dwell means to house permanently or to reside. Paul's desire is that Christ may settle down in the heart, that he might abide in and with them and that their relationship with Christ would not be simply a surface relationship, but an ever-deepening fellowship with God. You remember the story of Abraham and Lot. Lot had moved into Sodom. Abraham continued to abide in his tent. One day, the Lord, the incarnate Christ, and some angels came to visit Abraham. When Abraham came, or when God came to Abraham's tent to give him the promise of a son, he sat down and enjoyed a meal with Abraham. He fellowshiped with Abraham. But when the time was come to visit Sodom and the home of Lot, the Lord sent his angels ahead while he remained behind with Abraham. And even though Lot was a believer, the Lord did not feel at home in Lot's house as he did in Abraham's tent. I wonder if Christ came to visit your home, would he be comfortable? Would there be things you would want to put away or hide before he entered? Would Christ be at home in terms of your personal walk with God? 
Now keep in mind that nothing is hid from the sight of God. He knows everything about you. He knows all about your life. He knows everything you do, why you do it. There's nothing hidden. With your life as it is right now, would Christ feel at home or would he feel uncomfortable? The idea of dwelling is to be comfortable, to abide. We go to a house, we're comfortable there, we sit down, time flies by and it doesn't bother us. But you go someplace where you're uncomfortable and boy, you can't sit still. You can't wait to get out of there. You ever been to a family gathering where you didn't want to be there? And you couldn't wait to get out? You know, you didn't like what was taking place or, or something. You, you just weren't comfortable. You couldn't dwell there. So Paul says, first of all, in growing in deeper in our relationship with God, he prays that Christ may dwell with us, that he'd be comfortable in our lives. The second word he uses is the word rooted. Being rooted and grounded in love, verse 17. The word rooted, of course, speaks of a plant, specifically a tree. Psalm 1, verse 3, speaking of the blessed man, the Bible says, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The tree is fruitful because it is rooted near the water. Spiritually speaking, the water represents the Word of God. If you're going to be a spiritual or a fruitful Christian, I'm sorry, if you're going to be a fruitful Christian, you need to be rooted in the Word of God. Keep a finger there in Ephesians. Turn for a moment back to Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah expounds just a little bit on David's psalm. In Jeremiah 17 verses 7 and 8. Again, he's talking about the blessed man. Jeremiah 17, 7. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters. And notice this. And that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat cometh. But her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. That phrase, shall not be careful in the year of drought, simply means will not be anxious or worried about the drought. Why? Because their roots are spread out by the river. So here, Jeremiah emphasizes the importance of the roots. The tree is fruitful because the roots reach out into the moisture of the river. In Isaiah 37, verse 31, the Lord said to the remnant of the house of Israel, they shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. In order to bear fruit, you have to put down your spiritual roots. Colossians 2, 6, and 7. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted, and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. So Paul begins by reminding them that their salvation of their salvation and receiving Christ, but then he encourages them to continue in Christ, walking with the Lord, being rooted, built up, and established in the faith as they have been taught through the Word of God. Just as Paul told Timothy, continue in the things that thou hast learned, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Get your spiritual roots down. So in this idea of a deeper relationship, there's the matter of dwelling Christ feeling comfortable. There's a matter of being rooted in the word of God, getting your spiritual roots down. The third word we read here is the word grounded, being rooted and grounded. Warren Wiersbe mentioned that the word for grounded is an architectural term which speaks of the foundation upon which we are to build. Our ability to grow or to be built upon depends upon the depth and the quality of the foundation in our life. The foolish man failed to build on a solid foundation. When the storms of life came, the house was destroyed. The wise man, he built on a sure foundation. And when the storms of life came, the house stood firm. You know, while we admire the structure of the building, it's the foundation that determines the quality of the building as far as whether it can endure and persevere. And the same is true in the Christian life. You, what you see in my life, what I see in your life, that's the structure, the upper part of the building. What you do when you're alone with God, that's the foundation. 
I don't see that and you don't see that. But when a person's spiritual life comes crashing down, we say, what happened? They were such a good Christian. Well, what we saw looked good, but what we didn't realize was that the foundation was being destroyed. See, Satan attacks the foundation. He wants to destroy your personal walk with God. He wants to keep you from reading and studying the Word of God. He wants to keep you from praying. He wants to keep you from developing that relationship with God because if the foundation be destroyed, the house will fall. How deep is your walk with the Lord? To what depths are you willing to go in laying a spiritual foundation? How deep do your roots go into the Word of God? Does Christ truly dwell with you? That brings us to the third thing that he prays for, and that is comprehension. Comprehension. The word comprehension speaks of understanding, the ability to grasp something mentally. Now, in context, Paul is talking about the love of God. In being rooted and grounded in God's love, Paul prays that they might be able to comprehend his love. Now, that's not an easy request. Because God's love exceeds our human comprehension or understanding. And therefore, again, we see the need for the enablement of God. Even with God's help, I don't believe we'll ever fully understand the depth of God's love. But keep in mind that Paul is building one upon another. You'll never comprehend the love of God until you first begin to go in a deeper relationship with God. So as we grow deeper in the Lord, we begin to comprehend His love for us. Paul mentions here in terms of our comprehensions four things. He mentions the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height. God's love is higher than the heaven, deeper than hell, longer than the earth, and broader than the sea. Matthew Henry comments that the breadth of God's love speaks of its extending to men and women of all ages, nations, and ranks. The length of God's love is from everlasting to everlasting. The depth of God's love reaches to the lowest depths of sin, and the height of God's love raises us up to heavenly places. So Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, 38 and 39, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God wants us to comprehend His love toward us. That's why He sent His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into the world to manifest His love, 1 John 4, 9. Jesus Christ was to demonstrate, to manifest, to show us God's love. But Paul's not finished. Once we comprehend the love of God, we must also apprehend the love of God. That's the fourth thing, apprehension. To know the love of Christ that passeth knowledge is to go beyond simple comprehension or understanding. The word apprehend means to take hold of for yourself, to grasp. It comes from the word prehender. A monkey has a prehensible tail, meaning it can use its tail to grasp and hold on to branches. In Genesis 13, 17, God told Abraham, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Joshua 1.3, God told Joshua, Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. We could say the same thing about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God said, when you go into that land, wherever you walk, that land is yours. It's one thing to comprehend it. It's another to actually apprehend it. And as we're studying on Wednesday night, the life of Joshua, they're conquering the land. They're now apprehending that which God had promised them. They understood that God had given them this land, but now they actually had to go in and take possession of it. As you grow in the Lord, at some point, you have to go be beyond simply knowing what the Bible says. You have to go beyond simple understanding. You have to make a personal application in your life. It's one thing to, under, or to comprehend that Jesus Christ has died for your sin, but it's something more to apprehend that death for yourself. A person can comprehend the gospel but if they do not apprehend it, they're still lost. They may know what the Bible says, but if they've not accepted it personally, it does them no good. If they've never taken hold on the truth for themselves. I've witnessed many young people and even adults over the years who have comprehended the gospel, but they've never apprehended it for themselves. And what's true of salvation is also true in terms of sanctification and spiritual growth. 
It's one thing that, to know that God wants you to live a holy life. It's one thing to know that God wants you to study his word, to be faithful to his house, but it's a, quite another thing to actually do it. Paul says we need to go beyond knowledge. We must go beyond understanding. We must make the personal application in our lives and in our hearts. And that brings us to the final building block in the relationship with God, and that is the matter of fullness. That G might be filled, verse 19, with all the fullness of God. Paul prays that they might be filled with the fullness of God. It is the ultimate goal of the Christian life that we might be completely emptied of self and completely filled with Christ. Notice, first of all, the means of this fullness. How is it that we are filled with Christ? Each building block that we've looked at tonight is accomplished through the Holy Spirit. We're strengthened by the Holy Spirit. We grow deeper in our relationship with God with the Holy Spirit. We're able to comprehend and apprehend the love of God through the Holy Spirit. And the same thing is true in terms of our filling. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 13, I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter, yeah, verse, verse 18. Ephesians 5, verse 18. He says, And be not drunk with wine where it is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. The fullness of God comes through the filling of the Holy Spirit. But notice, secondly, that the measure of this fullness is God Himself. 2 Corinthians 10, 12, Paul tells us that we are not to measure ourselves by one another. That's foolishness but rather we're to measure ourselves against Christ. Look here in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. We'll look at this again when we get to the next chapter, but verse 13 says, Till we all come in the unity of the faith, to the knowledge of the Son of God, notice this, unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's our measuring stick. Our measuring stick is the stature of the fullness of Christ, not one another. Paul is talking about maturing in spiritual things. He contrasts that with verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. If you do not mature in the faith, if you do not grow up into Christ, you're nothing more than an immature child, spiritually speaking. Verse 15, he says, but speaking the truth and love may grow up into him. In all things, which is Christ, even the head. So Paul admonishes us to grow up into Christ. And then turn over to Colossians, and we'll close with this passage. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. <clears throat> Colossians 2, verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The fullness of God. Christ is our example of the fullness of God. Positionally, we are already complete. We are full in Christ. And in Christ dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. But practically, we must apprehend his fullness by faith. It is the result of a growing, maturing process. How often have you prayed this type of prayer for yourself? Lord, strengthen me. Lord, help me to grow that I might be full of Christ. How often have you prayed that way for others? Do we really desire to see ourselves and others grow in Christ or are we content just to be as we are? We have to be willing to pray as Paul prayed for spiritual enablement. God, help me to grow. Give me the faith and the courage to do what you have called me to do, even when I think I can't do it. Let's pray. Father, we thank thee for the time in thy word tonight. You will never ask us to do something that you will not enable us to do. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us in our spiritual walk to grow deeper in our walk with the Lord, not just to be a surface Christian, but to get our roots down, to be grounded, to have a firm foundation.
upon which to build, that Christ may be comfortable in our hearts, in our life. With all that we do, may we please Thee. That, Father, we might mature into the fullness of Christ. Father, we often look at older saints and those who have gone before, and we look up to them as great examples of faithfulness, and so we should. But, Father, each successive generation has to grow and take those steps to become that for the next generation. Father, we live in a day and age where it seems that the younger generation has forsaken the things of God. I'm so thankful for the young people that we have, the young adults, and likewise, Father, that have a desire for the things of God. Help them, Father, to grow as they become the leaders of the church in the next generation. Give them the courage to step up and to fill in the gaps, to do what they don't think they can do, but to trust you for the power to do it, for the abilities. <clears throat> We think of our Vacation Bible School upcoming. Pray that you would give us the ability, Father, to be faithful, that we might see boys and girls come to Christ. We pray that we'd see new families come, Father, that we've not had contact with before, that we might be able to minister to them. Thank you for the visitors that you have brought our way. Help us, Father, to be patient with them, that they might grow in the things of the Lord. Well, thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close tonight by taking our psalm books 315 deeper and deeper. 315 in your psalm books. <clears throat> 315 deeper and deeper. And we're going to sing the first stanza, the third stanza, and the fifth stanza. Verses 1, 4, and 5. Let's stand together as we sing. If you need to come to the altar to pray, the altar is open. We invite you to do that. But think about the words that you're singing as you sing, Into the heart of Jesus, deeper and deeper I go. Into the heart of Jesus. preaching. I don't know if it's made a difference to you. I've been trying to go slower. <laughs> Anybody noticed? <laughs> okay, maybe not. <laughs> I am making a concert effort to go a little bit slower in my pace. So now I have to adjust my messages to keep them in, in time if I move at a, a slower pace. But we only have two more verses in chapter three. and That'll be our next message. So I think that one, if I remember, was just a little bit shorter than this one. I didn't want to stop in the middle of the prayer. I wanted to try and get it all in in one message without necessarily going too fast. Wednesday night, we'll continue in our Clay Conquest, looking at Joshua. Uh, we'll be looking at the Seven Years' War, conquering the land, the Southern and the Northern Campaign. Saturday morning, our men's prayer breakfast. If you can help Caleb with the cooking, let him know that. Uh, you also would like to do some visiting maybe on Saturday. If there's someone that would like to go out with Caleb and do some visiting, you can check with him in regards to that. 
as well. I'll be a lot happening this week getting ready for vacation Bible school. Uh, Nick will be coming out and getting the yards mowed and trimmed and getting all that done this week. We've got to get the pavilion cleaned up and ready. Got a number of things at the sites that we'll be building, getting that all together. Looking forward to a great week. So be praying with us about Bible school that God will bless it, that we'll have a great week. Pray for good weather, pray for good attendance, and for souls to be touched with the Word of God. Let's be dismissed this evening in a word of prayer. Mr. Martin, would you dismiss us in prayer, please?